How should we regulate artificial intelligence? That's a question being asked with increasing urgency all over the globe. The UK is hosting an AI summit for world leaders to discuss responses to the most risky applications of this tech. The European Union is expected to reach a deal by the end of this year on its AI Act. And in the US, President Joe Biden has issued a wide-ranging executive order. It's meant to help US tech companies grow their talent pools and also prevent AI from being used to threaten civil rights and national security. I'm Jennifer Strong, and this is Shift. Now here on the steering column is a device called Auto Cruise. You simply set the speed you want to... Self-driving robo-taxis are already on the road in two US cities. How the disc rotates, a mirror reflects the light in the way that depends on how the signal was recorded. This is the 100 terabyte. I present to you Electro, the Mono Man. Ladies and gentlemen. I would say that one of my greatest skills is my ability to interact with humans. This episode, we're joined by Kari Johnson from Wired Magazine and Brown University's Suresh Vinkat Subramanian. Because you're listening to this podcast, I'm assuming you're interested in staying on top of the latest trends, news, and more. So I want to tell you about another show. It's called Web3 with A6NC Crypto, but it's really about the future of the internet, future of creators, future of business, future of the way we work and live. It's for anyone seeking to understand the latest tech trends direct from experts with high insights per minute, given your time and attention are so valuable. Follow Web3 with A6NC in your podcast app now. President Biden signed an executive order dealing with trust and safety in artificial intelligence. And so it's got dozens of directives for federal agencies to take certain actions, but also for private businesses to report their activity to the federal government if they're training AI models of a certain size. My name is Kari Johnson, and I'm a senior writer for Wired magazine covering artificial intelligence. It's really a sprawling report that gets into things like whether or not AI can help non-experts create chemical or biological weapons to protecting people's rights from tenant screening algorithms. To put it into the context, I've been covering this space for the better part of the last decade. And I recall periods in time where people worried about the human rights abuses that could be enacted by forms of automated decision-making really felt like they weren't being heard. And certainly there are lots of instances of people being harmed that we know of and that have been well-documented by journalists and researchers and others. This, it seems like a remarkable moment in history to some degree. It's an acknowledgement of the consequences that unchecked use of AI can have on people's rights and safety. What were some of the themes of this executive order? So the executive order was really kind of sprawling. It it, it hit on a lot of different areas in housing, for example, the Fair Housing Act, some clarification for language for landlords to make sure that they're not violating that existing federal law. Some of the other themes that were included, probably one of the top portions of this is that the executive order uses the Defense Production Act. This is a law that the president can use in wartime or was used for COVID-19 vaccine production, and it can compel businesses to do things. And so the Defense Production Act is being invoked to require companies training large AI models to report their activity to the federal government if those models may have something to do with national security or public health or the economy. And it also requires reporting of large compute clusters and things of that nature. There's also a requirement that requests the Secretary of Energy look at the use of how AI can 
produce outputs that touch on, I believe the acronym that the federal government uses is CBRN, chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear weapons. And so, you know, broadly speaking, the order is is calling for actions by numerous federal agencies around trust and safety in artificial intelligence. So overall, the White House is calling it the strongest set of actions any government in the world has ever taken on AI safety, security, and trust, unquote. Um, <laughs> you know, maybe, for, <laughs> you know, when the EU AI Act comes out in a couple months, to Depending on how the, I believe it's called the tripartite negotiations are going, you know, I feel like that's going to be quite influential. And we're watching the U.S. government move quickly, the U.K. AI Safety Summit. So, you know, there's a lot of activity along these lines. But I think when the EU AI Act goes into enforcement, that will certainly give that statement a run for his money. I'm intrigued to see this executive order has a series of directives that are required within roughly the next year. Some of the directives are like within the next 90 days and things like that, but roughly within the next year. Something that is noted in my reporting is to some degree, after the 2020 election, President Trump issued an executive order associated with artificial intelligence as well. And there are portions of that that just federal agencies did not comply with. And there's a history of a lack of compliance with AI regulation by federal agencies. Here in the U.S., there's also real limits on what an administration can do unless Congress takes action and gets on board with passing some laws, Mm -hmm. which feels unlikely in the immediate term. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I agree with that statement, 100 percent. You know, the amount of conversations about AI within Congress It's pretty striking, again, compared to a few years ago when people felt like nobody was really listening to the concern. Yeah. We just got back to a functioning House of Representatives, you know? You always remain hopeful. I think there appears to be a a, a fair amount of agreement on the types of things that could be done to better protect people and their rights and personal data in the age of AI. But whether or not Congress actually does that is a big question. I think that that's well reflected in my reporting that I've spent as much time paying attention to, let's say, AI regulation in New York City or the state of California or the state of Washington or wherever else, because there is a fracturing of if Congress doesn't do its job, state and local governments will make an effort at at it and there will be a lack of a uniform standard across the various governments in the U.S. What does this mean for companies? You know, at a high level, I think it means if you're developing a a large language model that could potentially produce outputs along these lines of a chemical, biological, or other forms of, of weaponry, then you might be concerned about this. You know, I I think there are harms that extend far beyond that list that are not part of the reporting mandate. And so at a high level, I think it means don't make AI that can destroy the planet. (laughs) Not that the the machine will go crazy, but the machine in the hands of non-expert actors who uh, or or state uh, funded actors with bad intent could go wrong. It's important to point that out as people talk about sentient machines and all that sort of stuff. But so you know, I, I think for the average company, if if you are dealing with large amounts of clusters, compute clusters, you know, um, then that that might you know be something that you would need to report to the federal government. Or if you're working on some of these applications like a large language model that can seemingly do anything. Right, like a foundational model. Yeah, you might have to report that. But more broadly speaking, I don't think it touches on the activity of private companies so much as it does on the actions of uh, federal agencies. One giant caveat to that, though, which is mentioned in my reporting, is uh, procurement. And the procurement policies really one of the number one ways that the U.S. government can use its purchasing powers 
to protect people. By putting strong standards on procurement, the U.S. government in its ability to, you know, the majority of algorithms used by federal agencies today, it's my understanding, are from private contracts. So if there are strong, responsible AI standards placed on that, then the market could adjust to make sure that they are complying with the federal government and able to get those contracts. Um, I think another thing that surprised me is the extent to which this executive order is trying to recruit talent in AI into the federal government. And if that is successful, then that could be rather influential over time as well, as the expertise within government can inform the types of assessments and other things that should be done on an AI system to ensure that it's safe before it comes into contact with with the public. I think it's important to note on the procurement element, most law enforcement agencies are state and local. You know, so the federal government deciding what procurement guidelines look like will certainly have an influence on, let's say, critical infrastructure, you know, algorithms that are used in dams or other places, but that won't really touch police departments. And so that is something that will need to be decided either by state and local procurement policy, or the government would need to perhaps tie federal funding to meeting those standards in order to protect people in that capacity. After the break, we speak with a co-author of the White House Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. We'll be back right after this. Hackers and cybercriminals have always held this kind of special fascination. Obviously, I can't tell you too much about what I do. It's a game. Who's the best hacker? And I was like, well, this is child's play. I'm Dina Temple Raston, and on the Click Here podcast, you'll meet them and the people trying to stop them. We're not afraid of the attack. We're afraid of the creativity and the intelligence of the human being behind it. Click Here, stories about the people making and breaking our digital world. AI machines, satellite, engine ignition, click here, and lift off. Every Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Suresh Venkatasubramanian. I'm the director of the Center for Tech Responsibility at Brown University. Formerly, I worked in the Biden administration in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, where I helped develop the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. So I would say there's a through line through the order that really says we cannot anymore put out AI pieces of tech out in the world without testing, without evaluating for various kinds of harms, and just expect people to be guinea pigs for the testing for these systems. It's a through line because in every part of the EEO, it talks about how we need to do better testing. We need to do evaluation. We need to have reports on these testing. And then, of course, the question is testing for what? And I think there's a huge chunk of the EO that talks about civil rights, talks about equity, talks about what should be done for testing, and talks about who should be doing it. Because it's an EO, it's targeted at government agencies. So there's a lot of tasking for government agencies involved there. But there's also you know, more guidance that will be coming out. The, the report mandates the Office of Management and Budget to put out specific guidance, which hopefully will be coming out very soon from what we hear. And that will have much more rich detail in it on exactly what agencies will have to do to comply. So I think that's a very strong message that's coming out of the EO. It's, you know, it's the first formal directive to the government to model good behavior, a responsible behavior when it comes to using AI. At a high level, what does this mean for companies? It doesn't mean anything for companies right now, except for the parts on generative AI. So the parts on generative AI, on the dual-use foundational models, the term that they use, there is going to be some expectation of reporting on, on, on the nature of testing and the, where they're doing the training if the models exceed certain thresholds, which I think is coming from some kind of open AI document, which makes me sort of raise my eyebrows a little bit at that thing. And I think that's worrisome. 
Um, and one should be questioning the value and content of that particular piece of the EO. But for the rest of it, this is focused on what government needs to do, right? So it's focused on government agents. So to the extent that private companies are going to be affected, it's going they're going to be affected most likely, and we don't know this for sure yet, because they are likely to be expected to produce evidence that their software complies, the systems they build AI comply with expectations coming from the EO and probably the OMB guidance. But we don't know for sure till we see what the guidance looks like. There is a lot of guidance in there for federal agencies, as you mentioned. What were some of the key highlights for you? I think the key highlight for me was the breadth. The fact that you know all agencies are charged with doing this. It's not focused on any one thing, right? Uh, not focused on any one application. It's focused broadly, but recognizing that every agency uses and interacts with AI differently, giving them that freedom to sort of figure out what needs to happen in their own segment. Right? There's all these detailed things that the HHS would be doing. There's detailed guidelines for labor and for workforce issues for the CFPB and for you know well, regulatory agencies broadly, but also for any entity working with credit and you know for HUD and so on. So it's very, it's both general and specific at the same time. And I think that's that that kind of has to be that way because you need the broad framework, but you also need agencies to customize based on what they need. I think what's missing, unfortunately, is that level of detail for law enforcement, and I would like to see more of that. Yeah, well, that is among the criticisms I've heard so far. Law enforcement largely in this country is state and local. And so largely this will leave law enforcement out. I mean, that that statement is true, but I don't think that's the biggest problem. Uh, in other words, I think it's true that a lot of law enforcement is state and local, but the federal government has a lot of influence over that through grant making abilities, right? So the DOJ gives money to state and local uh, law enforcement officials for various activities, and they have a lever of control there that they could be using. Again, we don't yet know what the OMB guidance will say, and it might say more about this, but at least the EO does not talk about this. And secondly, the EO, you know, the federal government itself uses various kinds of technologies, you know, risk assessment tools, um, facial recognition tools, other kinds of crime, you know, and there, there's no reason why those should not be under the purview of these systems. So there's some mention of basically expanding the scope of the policing EO that came out last year to sort of cover this, but the actions being asked for, are, I think, are still weak. And just to be clear, you weren't involved in this specific? I was not involved in any anything to do with the writing of this EO. Another thought here is that an EO is well and good, but there are limits to what can happen without Congress getting on board. I think we make change wherever we can and move things forward. Is it sat as satisfying as getting a piece of legislation? Depends on who you ask. I think for the federal government, this is a big deal and it will have a huge effect on the operations of the federal government. That does not to say that Congress doesn't have an, a hugely important role to play, because obviously an EO can only speak to what the federal government does and through its reach what it can do, but it's not nothing. What is it you think that people who are not computer scientists, who are not tech workers, what should the general public understand about what just happened? What they should understand is that for the administration to put out an executive order on AI, to do it so publicly, to have a signing ceremony where the president and the vice president show up and do this, shows that the administration thinks this is very, very important. And then to see the content of the EO with things like equity and civil rights playing a prominent role, with the responsibilities of agencies playing a prominent role, we believe that in order to harness the benefits of AI innovation, which is an important section of the EO, we must have guardrails around it. We must protect people and that people's protections are paramount. We can't just go on with business as usual, with you know, profit making as usual. That's what they're saying. You know, and I'm not, you know, I, I did work in this administration and I'm not there anymore. And I appreciate what they're doing. I do want to call out places where they could do better, but I think it's an important step. It's a, it's a big step, it's a broad step. And it's, you know, it's there's a lot of people who did a lot of work to get this out there, and it's, it's significant. It's not, it's not just a position paper, it's a real thing that will have real impact. What kind of impact this has, we have to stay tuned and keep an eye on things and make sure we're, the administration hears from all of us. We need to make sure we communicate with the administration so that they can respond to it. Are there key points that you think we should really be paying attention to? A lot of this will depend on what comes out from the OMB guidance. And I think it's important to remember that for people as well, that the OMB guidance is what agencies are exactly told to do. 
And so we're going to be looking, all of us should be looking very closely at what that guidance look like and what does the implementation look like. I think what this EO is doing is saying, we are now going to start a process of rolling out protections across the board in all agencies. And the thing to pay attention to is, okay, so it's been 180 days. What have you done? It's been 240 days. What have you done? That's going to be very important. You can declare victory if you want, but it's not done yet. The job is not done till the changes are made. Again, law enforcement is clear one. And related to law enforcement and immigration, and broadly speaking, the sort of national securitization of things that are not. The problem is once things come under the national security umbrella, it's very hard to say you can't stop us from doing anything we want to do because it's a national security issue. But the tools we use are not, and they should be under the same purview as everything else. You know, we might have policies about who comes in, but we shouldn't be discriminating against people and using bad tech. And I think it's important for that to be covered. So that's, I think, something that's, you know, not enough discussed and exposed in the EO. And, you know, I hope that with the broad culture change that this EO could represent for how agencies think about technology, that this culture change will seep into, you know, the DOJ and the DHS as well, but we'll see. Now, one thing I do want to add, which I think people don't maybe see enough of is that this is, these things don't happen in a vacuum. This has been the result of a lot of work over many years by many, many groups, especially on the outside who've been campaigning for people's rights and for equity for a long time. It's, it's, it's easy to see when something happens like this, oh, this happened and it all happened very quickly, but it also happened very slowly. Yeah, in the same way that generative AI did not actually happen in two weeks last year. Exactly. The show is produced by me and Anthony Green with help from Emma Silicons. It's mixed by Garrett Lang with original music from him and Jacob Gorski. Thanks for listening. I'm Jennifer Strong.